Hey, welcome. Today we're going to be talking through what you need to know for an AP Physics class that uses calculus about definite integrals. I'm going to talk you through some problems, what a definite integral is, how to calculate a definite integral, and how to relate them to indefinite integrals, which I just talked about in a lesson. I'll put a link to that in the upper right right about now. And I know on this screen there's a lot of information, so let's just break it down, take it piece by piece so you don't get overwhelmed. All right, and let's take a look at this top left white box right here to review what we've talked about with an indefinite integral. First of all, you do have that summation symbol, that integration symbol on the left-hand side right over here, and it just means the sum of a nearly infinitesimally small rectangles that approximate the area under a curve, and those rectangles are so small that basically that is the area under a curve. And we talked last time about why that's important in the sense of solving for physics unknowns and, and addressing things. So that's what's going on here. The function that you're given's technical name is an integrand, and then this is a differential dx over here. It just means, essentially, it's like a label telling us what variable we're going to be differentiating in, in terms of respect to x in this case. All right, and the answer that you get is one antiderivative. Now, this is something I haven't really talked about yet, but an antiderivative and an integral are nearly synonymous, but they're not exactly the same thing. An antiderivative is a solution to an integration problem, so it's one solution. But it turns out, remember, that you have this constant, the c value, the constant of integration. So you actually have a whole set of answers that could satisfy this problem, so to speak. Like, what's the integral of some function, some integrand? Well, the answer is actually a set of answers, and that's what we mean by an integral, whereas an antiderivative is one specific answer with one c value, you could say. All right, and so let's take a look at the bottom left white box, and I want you to think to yourself, what is different here? What's different in the bottom left white box than the upper left white box? All right, so hopefully you've noticed that there is an upper bound and a lower bound here. Those are the key differences. I'm going to erase part of that so I don't cover up something I want you to see, but you get the idea. So the key difference between a definite integral and an indefinite integral is we are setting boundaries. We are setting bounds where we say, all right, within these constraints, so to speak. So this is our lower bound in a graphical form, and this is our upper bounds. And notice what we're doing is we're saying, all right, if x is equal to zero, between x equals zero and x equals five, what is the area under the curve? That's, that's what we're doing here with this specific definite integral. So we have this lower bound and an upper bound, and we determine how much area there is under the curve. So an example of this is if we're talking about time as our variable, we want to set typically time as zero as our lower bound, and then some upper bound at some higher value. Or it doesn't have to be zero. It could be you know time like a lower bound of 10 seconds and an upper bound of 20 seconds. It's really dependent on the problem. One other obvious difference that you may have noticed is that there's no constant of integration down below in the definite integral, and that's because we are getting an answer that is a definite solid number, so to speak, as our answer to the question, how much area do we have under a curve given this upper and lower bounds? Whereas for an indefinite integral, we're sort of asking the question, what family or set of equations could answer the question, what is the area under a curve of a function? And that could be a set of answers, so to speak. So that's why we need to include the constant c for indefinite integrals, but it is not thrown into a definite integral situation. I will say as a side note, I'm using Desmos to demonstrate this. They're a great website. I can put a link to them in the description of this screencast here. All right, and so what I would like to do next is to take a look at the major strategy for definite integrals and then do some example problems and see how it goes. So first of all, to take a definite integral, what we're going to do is take the integral of the upper bounds inserted for the variable minus the integral of the lower bound inserted for the variable. So let me show you what I'm talking about with this. We have our polynomial function, our integrand right here. And so we're going to say this is equal to 12 times x to the third. Well, we make that n value an additional 1. And then we divide it by the n plus 1 over here. 
minus 9 times x, not to the second, but to the third, and then we divide it by that n plus 1 value, plus 2x over here. And now we're going to use a new symbol. It's just a vertical line that's kind of long. And we're going to say 6 to 1. So we're going to signify, all right, do this in such a way where you plug in a 6 as your upper bound into this situation here, and the 1 as your lower bound. But first, let's go ahead and simplify this a bit. So we're going to say that ends up being 3x to the 4th minus 3x to the 3rd plus 2x, and then the same symbol of 6 and 1. All right, now at this point, I'm basically going to take this upper bound and plug it in where the x values are effectively, and then do the same thing for the lower bound and subtract the lower from the upper. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So that's going to be equal to, and I'll use brackets here, 3 times 6 to the 4th minus 3 times 6 to the 3rd plus 2 times 6 in brackets. So that's my upper bounds. Subtract the lower bound. Lower bound is just 1, so that's going to be 3 times 1 to the 4th minus 3 times 1 to the 3rd plus 2 times 1 and put that over here. And I believe if you do the numbers correctly, you end up with this. All right, so that's how you would go about evaluating and solving for the amount of area in between the two points that we signify on the x-axis, so the upper and the lower bound. All right, so now that you've seen some example problems, it'll make more sense now if I talk about some properties of integrals because you'll have something to relate it to. This one right here, the issue with this is if you take an integral, a definite integral from a certain point, like your lower bound is the same as your upper bound, then there is effectively no area in between those two bounds. So it makes sense to say that that will be equal to zero. The second property over here, if you have a constant, what you can do, just like with derivatives, is you can take that outside of the function. So if you have just a number multiplied by x squared, or like 2x squared or something, you can take the two outside of the whole integration, and that can save you some effort later on as well. All right, this is just this number three. If I label these one, two, and three. Number three, if you take a look at that, that is just saying essentially you can split up integrals and sum them together. Like you can do the integration separately and then put them back together at the end when you get the answer. This next property over here, number four, is talking about the inverse of an integral in terms of a definite integral it's going to give you the same answer. It's just going to be a negative answer. Number five is saying similar things. You can use plus and minus. And number six, this is useful if you think about your x-axis, if you have like your a, b, and c. If you want to break this up into two parts, you can do so. Like you break it up in your first part right here and, and then break it up into a second part as well, going from say b to c. That's a possibility as well. So that's what that sixth principle is talking about. All right, and that's what I needed to cover to get you started with definite integrals, to hopefully understand the basics of them and be able to start working with them. I'm going to do one more lesson in this series, and I've done screencasts for the entire year of physics, and I'm going to be doing more and more with AP Physics as well, most likely. If you have any comments down below, please let me know, and I hope you all have a great day. Take care.